Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Genuine Chit Chat. This week, I'm joined by my friend Josh for another edition of Science But Simple. Now, for anyone who hasn't joined us for Science But Simple before, essentially, it's just Josh, who has a degree in marine biology and is training to become a teacher. He teaches me sciencey things, sort of everyday stuff. You know, one of the first episodes we did, we did about light bulbs. We've done ones about the tide and the moon and other sort of sci- and scientific misconceptions and things. Um, and in this one, we specifically talk about germs. Now, the point of Science for Simple is just so someone who isn't that science capable or science knowledgeable can listen to these sort of episodes and just get like a general overview and understanding of things. Um, If you're like I am, I don't pick up all the science buzzwords and all these sorts of the real specifics of it, but I like to have a general idea of how things work. And this episode is much like all the other Science for Simple episodes, it's just that. Now, in this one in particular, as I said, we speak about germs and we speak about sort of viruses and why vaccines don't work on them, why you wouldn't get autism from vaccinations and what yeah, vaccinations actually do to your body, how antibodies work and antigens and antibiotics and things, um, how blood donations work and why there's different blood types and things, um, how some diseases can get sort of uh, resistant to a lot of things and they become sort of super bugs, a bit like MRSA. And we talk about how cells read and communicate with each other with these biological barcodes and loads more so it's a lot to get your teeth into now as usual guys you can follow us on the usual social media channels be it instagram twitter or facebook um be sure to check us out on any of those things and if you enjoy the show be sure to pass it on to other people you know this is science but simple so it's quite a science orientated episode but if you're first time tuning in if you enjoy this one you know check out some of the other episodes you know this show isn't Every episode isn't necessarily going to be interesting to every person, but I do quite a wide variety of shows with a wide variety of guests talking about all kinds of topics. So I'm sure there'll be at least one episode that someone you know will enjoy. And if you find that episode and you think it deserves it, send it their way. See if they'll enjoy it. Anyway, that's about enough for me rambling for now. Um, Coming up is a promo for the Two and a Half Amigos podcast. And then after that, we'll get straight onto the show. Um, And then after that, right at the end, I'll come back as a little outro. I'll explain sort of the episodes coming up as well as, you know, a bit more details about this, that and the other. It's just for any fans of the show, it's kind of a good way to get a bit of information on the upcoming episodes and that sort of jazz. So, yeah, thanks as always for tuning in, guys. I appreciate all of you listening and I'll talk to you all at the end. Hey guys, this is Scott and Mark with the Two and a Half Amigos. We're just hanging out talking about random thoughts, stolen gold medals, box office nightmares, and today's blunders. If these are the topics you would like to listen to, check us out on YouTube and all the other podcast apps. Welcome to Genuine Chit Chat, where we have honest conversations with interesting people. And I'm your host, Mike Burton. You won't have the headphones on, will you? No, you won't. No, I don't wear headphones during podcasting, which apparently is some sort of big podcasting issue. A lot of people are like, no, you, you need to listen to, you need to wear headphones every fucking second of podcasting, because how will you find out if the levels are bad? So. By looking. Because you test them beforehand. Well, I test them and beforehand. And then use an equalizer in post. <laughs> well, exactly. Equalizer, normalizer, you know, there's loads of post production things you can do. And I just do that. So that's why I don't wear them. Scrubs. <laughs> All these professional podcasters, scrubs. The main reason I don't do it is just because most of my guests aren't people, or a lot of my guests aren't people. A lot of your guests aren't people. (laughs) That's it. It's it's because they're women. Oh! No, okay. Obviously joking. Um, Whoa. Zero to 100. (laughs) (laughs) They're the kind of guests that aren't, like, are are already quite nervous coming on anyway a lot of the time. I've had Mm -hmm. quite a few people come on to talk about anxiety and things, and there's a couple of people who are really nervous about doing it beforehand. And if you give them headphones as well as a microphone, it freaks them out even more a lot of the time. So it's like, Mm -hmm. and also I don't like it. I can't, hearing my voice latency, drives me insane oh yeah I, I would imagine that'd be incredibly distracting yeah I mean I, can, I could adjust it so it is like I could faff about and make it so it's, there's no latency to it but then you, you can actually hear your voice in your own head all the time and it's like I can't <laughs> I hear my own voice enough thank you I don't need to hear it right in my own ear thank you um, but anyway we're back for another episode of Science But Simple because you know Hooray. learning you know and I've got to have you and Reese on at some point in the next while to uh, do a another gaming one but we actually talk about bait gaming being good, not yeah. <laughs> the crap. It's been too history. long since I have told everyone how uh, you hold me prisoner in my own home. <laughs> that is true. Uh, I do. You're not allowed food unless you podcast. Mm. 
podcast as you're a couple of months worth of food and that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but well, I still have to buy. Yeah, you have to buy and you have to cook and you have to store, yeah. but it's just you're not allowed to buy it. <laughs> I have that power over you somehow, like an electronic leash or something. Um, but this episode, we, we've got quite a few notes of future episodes we've got to sort, but this one was kind of, it's kind of going to be a mix, isn't it? I think the, the, the jumping off point was yeah. MRSA, but mm-hmm. if you want to kind of fire off the, uh, well, the general idea of what we're going to talk about apart from MRSA. So we mentioned MRSA, which then branches into a load of things about antibiotics and um, general useful tips in terms of your health stuff. Hmm. Um, like if you go to the doctor and are given antibiotics, like this is what you should do. Um, because literally it's bad if you don't <laughs> yeah. for you and for everybody else. Um, and then that goes into other things like vaccines, clear up some information about vaccines. <laughs> um, the misinformation about vaccines. Mm-hmm. There is a lot of it. Uh, and then go into some other misconceptions and general stuff. So it's only a bit of one of those misconception episodes, but we'll focus it, I think, around some medical bits and some biology bits and just see where it goes towards the end. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Yeah. Why, why not? I'll fire away then, Josh. Mm-hmm. What does... MRSA stand for, and you only get one shot. I'm glad you asked. I wrote this down because it's hard. I'll take this slowly so that I can say it, and also so everyone can keep up. (laughs) Um, Metacillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Now say it ten times really fast. (laughs) No. (laughs) So, um, what I know vaguely about MRSA is basically is it uh, an anti is basically a, a antibiotic resistant infection. Uh, yes, well, a bacteria, specifically because an infection can be, the, the flu is an infection, yeah. a virus, like all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a bacteria, um, and it is uh, antibiotic resistant, mm-hmm. um, which is why, so like anything else in terms of species, bacteria also have that two-name system, like humans would be homo sapien, all that sort of thing. Um, so it, the bacteria is Staphylococcus aureus, and it's a particular strand of that bacteria because there are regular Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, I can say it. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> um, there are, and they're not metacillin resistant because metacillin is the antibiotic. Basically, anything cillin is an antibiotic. Okay. Like penicillin, penicillin hmm. which is great because I will always remember the fungus that produces penicillin. Because one of the things about antibiotics is that they are created by, um, essentially, most of the time I think it's fungi. It might be all the time, it might be particularly kind of fungi. Um, and the one that creates penicillin, it sounds like a Harry Potter spell. Go on then. Penicillium notatum. That is very good. It is, it is, is very Harry Potter. Potter. Sounds like literally cure wounds or something, I suppose the spell would be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's basically known quite widely as the hospital superbug. Yeah. Because it's, once you've got it, it's nigh on impossible to treat properly because antibiotics no longer work on it. Is it one of the things that you get it and they can kind of put, they can try and help you, but at the end of the day you're gone? Or is it more of a thing of you get it and it's just down to your immune system and that's that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. It may be dependent on the person and the severity of the infection and all that sort of thing. There's probably a lot of variables involved. Yeah. The bottom line is that antibiotics are not effective at treating MRSA. Mm. There are lots of controls that they have in hospitals and things. Like you may have heard some at some point uh, something about hospitals starting to use things like copper alloy door handles and bed frames and stuff. I heard something about copper door frame, uh, copper door handles and things. Yeah, yeah, because copper alloys or copper uh, maybe. I don't know whether it's specifically alloys or whether it's the copper itself that is the thing, but the copper is important regardless. Um, they actually, MRSA is killed essentially on contact. And from what I just looked up, apparently, like legally, um, the manufacturers can say that copper alloys kill 99% of MRSA within two hours. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's really good at controlling the spread Hmm. because that's the best thing you can do to stop something like that is to control how much it can spread. If it can't spread, then it's such a massively lower risk. Hmm. And 
doing that is, is part of it because there's antibiotics is something that you can't do for it anymore. Mm. The way that that works is essentially via, uh, it'd be wrong to call it natural selection. It's more of an, uh, artificial selection because what you're doing is like, um, you're providing what would be called a selection pressure. So there are going to be variations in all the bacteria and some of them will be resistant slightly to the antibiotic. When you apply the antibiotic, not all of them may be killed. Mm-hmm. And antibiotics work in two ways. They can stop the bacteria from reproducing or they can rupture that, that the bacteria's cell, cell membranes and cell wall to literally kill it. Mm-hmm. So they either kill or stop it from multiplying. Uh, and that then means that if there are leftovers because they're resistant to that, then you essentially what you've done is just increased the amount of bacteria in the population proportionately that are resistant to that antibiotic. Yeah, so very- then they multiply and reproduce and reproduce yeah. and reproduce. And then they're all... Yeah. resistant so the way i'm thinking of it like layman's terms is like you get a room full of 100 people and then say five of them are immune to something you kill mm-hmm. the other 95 and those five are left just repopulate and obviously because they repopulate yeah. the the, actually the genes spread down and then it makes that once they repopulate up to that number of 100 all of them should be resistant and then it's like you try and do that that also that kind of culling again and it won't do anything the and culling that's... is a good point because there's a similar reasoning to why people would object to the badger culling at the moment mm. because all you do is concentrate the level of bovine tuberculosis in the badger population mm-hmm. so then more badgers at the end of the cull proportionately have bovine TB mm. and then they reproduce and then more badgers still have bovine TB yeah so they can spread it yeah, that's... so it's that's a contentious topic because mm. um, there's arguments either way, this and the other. Yeah, um, culling but... and hunting are very is a very grey area, mm-hmm. which I've covered on the podcast before. So go check out the back catalog. Culling, that's... culling has its merits in certain situations. I'm not sure it's the correct solution for the badger, the bovine TB issue. I um, honestly know very little about badgers or tuberculosis. <laughs> I didn't even know the culling them was you, but culling them actually used bovine tuberculosis. Why bovine? No, it- the, the, the bovine tuberculosis is what they carry. Oh, and it's okay. a threat to the cattle. I was going to say, because I was like, bovines are cows and like yeah. that sort of family of animals. So I was like, okay, yes. that makes sense. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, so, yeah. We're talking about the antibiotics. Antibiotics and stuff. The other thing is the um, bacteria have a feature that they can use inside the cells. They have DNA, like other um, cells. Uh, it's not a nucleus, it's just a loose, like, uh, circular DNA thing. Mm-hmm. They also have separate little pockets of DNA called plasmids. I've heard that bac- word. Yeah, and bacteria can actually transfer plasmid, plasmids between each other, which is called horizontal, I think it's horizontal inheritance. Right. Or horizontal gene transfer. Cause that plasmid may contain the gene that gives them resistance to the, the antibiotic. Mm-hmm. They then have a few of those plasmids and pass them on to other bacteria nearby to them. Oh, wow. Okay. So then they just, they literally make other, without reproducing, they make other bacteria resistant. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's why it's such a problem. Mm. Um, the way to try and solve that, which is why you always, always bang on about finish your course of antibiotics Mm -hmm. is because a lot of the things that aren't resistant yet have some level of resistance, but not enough to protect them fully. So if you are on antibiotics for two weeks, even if you are symptomless, because symptoms are caused by your immune system, your body's response to an infection Mm -hmm. most of the time. If you think, oh, my symptoms are gone, I don't need my antibiotics anymore that bacteria is probably still inside you and then can repopulate and grow. And now it's resist more resistant to that antibiotic mm-hmm. whilst you did not finish the course. Yeah. You did not purge that bacteria fully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why it's so important. Yeah. And that's one of the, one of the potential risks in the future is people think that we might actually start creating far, far, far too many highly resistant, antibiotic resistant bacteria 
and there'll be some sort of super bug, uh, essentially like massive population oh, yeah. damage to the human to human population. I've heard about that sort of thing quite a lot, especially I think the biggest one people are worried about is the flu, because obviously flu jabs and things are quite ubiquitous. It's just over. I know flu jabs are slightly different store the thing, yes. but you know what I mean. Like it's that sort of flu is kind of everywhere and can kill anyone, especially the young and the old and the mm-hmm. sort of weak. Uh, weak may just sound like so aggressive. A- anyone, but weak with, ones. anyone with a weakened or potentially underdeveloped immune system yeah. is at risk. Yeah, a vulnerable sort of um, individuals, yeah. and it's like obviously if there was a flu that was untreatable by anything, then it could you know especially if it became incredibly contagious it could just I mean, spread you look at Spanish flu from after the war and stuff we have also obviously there's bird flu swine flu all these sorts mm-hmm. of other I mean that's more recent times I know they're not necessarily the same animals but obviously mm-hmm. the, the genes I assume with uh, the with like bird flu swine flu was it like swine flu maybe because uh, pigs are sort of biologically similar in some way it could transfer easily or maybe it's like a mutation it's know. normally this is the moment to probably switch over to talk about viruses and vaccines okay yeah sure. um so you mentioned the flu jab yeah. is that flu jabs are a vaccine. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why you might need a new flu jab every year is because viruses very, very rapidly uh, evolve or mutate might be the better word mm-hmm. because the way that they reproduce requires other living cells. They can't reproduce themselves. Mm-hmm. They have to insert their DNA into a cell and then they have to get that cell to produce more viruses that then burst out and spread around. Mm-hmm. So there's contention over whether you even call a virus a living thing because it can't reproduce autonomously. It mm-hmm. has to use another thing to reproduce, which technically parasites do in certain cases, mm-hmm. but parasites, are, it's like the parasites still produce eggs and all that sort of thing. They can reproduce. They just need to live inside something. Mm-hmm, yeah. Whereas a virus cannot just produce more viruses. It needs, to, it needs, it does not have the structures itself in its body to be able to produce more viruses and reproduce. Yeah. If anyone's uh, having an issue, not issues following this because you're explaining it perfectly, is what I, the only reason I'm even here, apart from it being my show, is, uh, explaining things in layman terms. The most popular, easy to understand virus that everyone who's listening to this sort of podcast who understands general media, zombie. Like, I know it's mm-hmm. stupid, I know zombie virus isn't technically a thing, but it's that thing of, you know, the, you, the zombies for, generally speaking, for most shows, you can't, zombies don't reproduce. They infect others, and then others become yes. zombies and infect others. And it's kind of that thing of, yeah, an infection infects a being, and then that being becomes more and more infected by it, and then they become spreading of it and it's a really yeah. simple way of kind of understanding the yeah it's not things. it's not too bad a way of like thinking about it if you were th- if you were to think of um a zombie as a virus yeah and other humans as cells yeah exactly you're yeah. turning those cells into propagators of the virus mm-hmm. yeah and that's what you're doing yeah 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 so the thing is antibiotics only work against bacteria Okay. Because of that whole bursting the membranes and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So viruses is, is ineffective against viruses. And basically when people say, oh, I've got a cold and they won't give me any antibiotics, it's like, yes, because they won't work. Right. And if you start taking antibiotics when you shouldn't, you're only further contributing to that resistance problem. Mm-hmm. And then the vaccines thing, uh, so the flu jab, what they do is they have a recent version of the virus that is weakened, dead, whatever you want to call it, inactive, all that sort of thing. Um, and they give you a sample of that so that your immune system goes, ah, new thing, kill it, yeah, gets rid of it. And then it's familiar with that virus so that when you encounter the actual thing, your body has essentially a memory of that virus yeah. and knows then exactly what it needs to do to deal with it. It's basically just training your body to learn to fight the, a weaker version of this mm-hmm. thing, and then when the big boy comes out, they know exactly what they're doing. It's like it's like your immune system essentially has muscle memory. <laughs> yeah, like if you you encounter something before and you do something, it's like okay, now the body's like, oh, I know what to do in this situation. Here we go, let's get on with it. Yeah, is, um, it, is that why people? I, I don't know if you know this, but is that why people sometimes get symptoms when they get flu jabs and things? Because it's like the yeah, because thing. it's still like as you said, symptoms are produced by your immune responses. Yeah. So if you're taking a vaccine. 
a decent number of people will just because it's so easy for the body to deal with because it's not trying to reproduce mm-hmm. um, a small amount of people will have like some form of reaction um, but it'll be minor versions yeah. it's like okay so yeah you might get a little bit like sniffly and coffee or something after you had a vaccine right mm. but that's a small price to pay for not being like uh, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those I make it. when I when I die. That's the yeah. words I make. With um, uh, just for clarity, with um, sinuses and things, uh, is it mm-hmm. with uh, phlegm and mucus and things? Especially when people's nose get blocked up. You know, that's mm-hmm. the most commonly associated thing when someone is in air quotes ill. You know, they get blocked up nose and things. Is that to try and? Am I right in thinking that the, the mucus and stuff is basically that kind of tries to catch the back, like any other things mm-hmm. going in your body and? You're basically trying to expel it, essentially. That's what yeah. the body kind of... It's basically like big bits of glue that all the bacteria kind of get stuck in yeah. it. Yeah. And all the cells that line all that way have like tiny hairs on them. The cilia cells. Called cilia. Yeah. Boy! It's my uh, tiny like the, hair, the hairs are called cilia. <laughs> um, the cells would be ciliated epithelial cells. No, you're showing off. Um, epithelial basically just means lining. Yeah. Um, you have different sorts of epithelial cells. Mm-hmm. Um, but the ones up in your airways will have tiny hairs that essentially like waft the stuff towards the exit. The hand mo- movements you're doing are gold. And I wish <laughs> for the first time this was not on almost exclusively audio <laughs> podcast because that was amazing. Well, that's why, uh, you know, smoking, uh, is, is bad for that because what well, I'm aware that smoking does, it basically it damages those hairs, uh, with yep. the cells and the hairs mm-hmm. off those cells. Mm-hmm. And then it means that it can't fight off infection as easily because the cells can't yeah. wave the phlegm and mucus in the right direction, essentially. Mm-hmm. One mm-hmm. of the many things, but yeah. Um, okay, cool. So. Um, we were talking about obviously viruses. Um, that's where you need to, to vaccinate, and you can't use antibiotics yes. to get vac- uh, against yeah. viruses. And the common cold is that that's a virus, then. Yes, that's a virus. Okay, okay, makes sense. Um, so, what is um, do do we want to move on to the sort of vaccination uh, misconceptions, or do you have uh, some more topics for this sort of? Uh, so we can start moving on towards that. Um, one of the things to mention now we're talking about some immune system bits is that there's lots of antis in here because mm-hmm. we have antibodies, uh, we have antibiotics which we covered, and we have antigens, mm-hmm. um, and it's yeah, very confusing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll try my best. <laughs> um, antibodies are essentially um, markers that your body produces in response to an infection that will help identify things that are foreign bodies, Mm -hmm. that'll help clump together and group together things that are foreign bodies. And that is because they are specific to something called an antigen, which is on the surface of all cells. Mm Mm-hmm. Foreign, like non you cells, your cells, everything. Mm -hmm. And the antigens that make up your cells or are on the outside of your cells are very important because that's how your body identifies yourself. Like a, like a tag, like a barcode almost. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, and anything that doesn't have your biological barcode on, your body's like, nope, nope, get it out, be gone. Is that why you need different blood types, like uh, that, that sort of thing? Yes. Blood is very, very easy because it's got a very limited amount of antigen to it. Mm-hmm. When you've got A, B, and there's three types of, an- there's three types of antigens on blood. There's what would be called A antigens, B antigens, and then the plus minus antigens. And mm-hmm. um, with the plus being present and the minus being not. Mm-hmm. So if you've got A, B positive blood, you have all three of those antigens. Mm -hmm. And that makes you very selfish. (laughs) Because... Pun intended. um, What that means is, because you have all three antigens present, if you're injected with blood of somebody else, whatever blood type they have, it doesn't matter because those antigens are somewhere or not there at all. Mm Mm-hmm. So your body's like, oh, no, this is fine. Are they, is that the people who can give blood and that blood can go to anyone? No. This is the other way around. Okay, okay. So AB positive means you can receive anybody's blood, mm-hmm. but you can only give blood to other AB positive people. Right. Because if you give your blood to somebody that is just, say, A positive, mm-hmm. the B antigens on your blood the recipient's body will be like, no, no, this isn't, this isn't me. No, get rid of it. Yeah, I see. And immune response. Mm-hmm. 
in your entire circulatory system. Yeah, yeah. Really good. <laughs> Not good. Uh, and then the opposite would be the O negative because O is absence of A and B, mm-hmm. and the negative is not plus. Yeah. So O, negative blood, has no antigens, as far as I'm aware, mm-hmm. as far as I, as far as my knowledge goes. I may yeah. be wrong, but this is, this for the purpose of donating blood, yeah. O negative is universal donor. That's my mum. Because they can give to anybody, because there's no antigens, so their blood will not elicit a immune response from anybody. Yeah, yeah. My but mum, mum's got that one. But they can only receive other O negative blood mm. because the antigens on those blood cells will trigger an immune response. Yeah, yeah. So they can only take other blood that also has none of those antigens on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, and that's like that's that's the same way that your antibodies will identify those antigens, mm-hmm. or your body will make antibodies to fit specific antigens, and then these antibodies are like attached to it. And say, okay, look, over here, over here, pick me. Yeah. Um, and your white blood cells will then engulf those foreign bodies and destroy them. Mm-hmm. Or they'll be, uh, they essentially, um, clumped together. A lot of the time it starts clumping them together. And then that means that the white blood cells can engulf lots of things at the same time because they're all like stuck to each other by these antibodies. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just, ba- that's a very basic way of how there's lots more that goes on and different types of white blood cells and this, that, and the other. But for a short end of it, that's how the immune system works. Yeah. And that's what we want here. Here, we just want things as easy, easily accessible and in a sense, scratching the surface, getting a little bit deeper, mm-hmm. but not getting too deep. Cause you know, you could sit here and talk probably for an hour or two almost solely on white blood cells. And it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, that'd be so, cool for free people. But to then put that, connect that up to the vaccination side. Yeah. When you're giving someone those inactive, dead, whatever you want cells, what you're doing is presenting that body with an example of, Hey, look, here's an antigen. You should probably recognize this. Mm -hmm. And then your body will make antibodies for that. And then when you encounter the actual thing, Mm -hmm. your body's like, oh, I know that. And rapidly produces those antibodies to start actively fighting it early on rather than having to start that process from ground zero. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know why, but the way I thought of this was almost like loads of little soldiers and basically they're fighting like an enemy made out of wood. And they try all sorts of different things and they can't almost figure out how to destroy it. And then they use fire and they go, (gasps) fire beats that one. And then the bigger one comes and they immediately from the get go don't need to try out any of the other methods. They just go fire straight away. That's what I thought Mm. of, which is really layman's terms. In a way, yeah. Yeah, real layman's terms, like proper like (laughs) five-year-old layman's terms, but still. Um, Okay, so... With the vaccination, uh, are you called cool to go on to the misconceptions now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what do, you want to, what do you want to talk about? Well, the biggest misconception uh, with vaccinations is the, the autism one. Um, right, we, yeah. Which is, bef- just to preface this, obviously try not to get too political in uh, science, but simple, but if you have a child and the choice, if it, if this was actually the case, if you could actually get autism from vaccinations, which you can't, but even if you could, the idea that some parents would rather have a child with measles who could potentially die and kill other children than be like socially inept in sort of a disability sense, you know, it's have be on the autistic spectrum, which even if you look at autism in general, like you can be really like you can be an autistic person and still function in society perfectly well and people it barely even notice mm-hmm. so it's not even like you know full on you get autism and suddenly you can't function as a human so it's like even before we go into the science of why it's stupid anyway even if it was the choice if i had a kid and it was like well they could either get measles and potentially die or they could have autism it's like well obviously i choose autism you know what I mean? Like it, it's it it just it does trigger me like how hearing people make Sorry. such a fuss about anti vaxxers and it's just like, you fucking idiots. Not only are you putting everyone else's children at risk, but also you're being a selfish asshole for your own child because you'd rather have a dead kid than a, a slightly disabled one, which is ridiculous. Oh, anyway, I'm done. I, that's it, that's just like in my head that's gone back to um Eddie is our death star cancer. Say that again, Eddie is our Eddie is our death star cancer. No, okay. it's not Death Star Cantina. Do you mean it's Cantina? Or, yeah, Cantina. <laughs> it's Cake or Die. Cake or Death. I remember that. Autism I rem- or Death. 
<laughs> well, yeah, exactly. That is basically what they're saying. Um, so how, how is I'm it? I'm sorry, but we're out of autism. I'll have the chicken then, please. <laughs> so so uh, obviously, I don't know uh, a huge amount about autism, but from what I vaguely know, I think it's genetic or something it like that. It is. I'm not entirely sure. It's complex. Yeah. Um, I doubt even... I doubt I, there's very few people that would even be comfortable saying they know exactly what causes autism. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, but we can say that considering the amount of people that have had vaccines and don't have autism, <laughs> uh, the, the statistics of the amount of people that have had a vaccine and do have autism and didn't have autism before <laughs> is probably very, very low. <laughs> Just imagine getting a flu jab <laughs> and then just waking up like a state and being autistic. It, like, yeah. that doesn't make the, any sense. What I would probably say is the most agreed thing is that it's a developmental condition. Mm-hmm. I hesitate to even call it a condition because apart from the... Well, it's because it's it's difficult to put into words this. Yeah. Um, it depends on the person. And there's different levels of this, that, and the other. Well, it's a load of different things in terms of social interaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's lots of to do with, like, sensory perception and sensory overload and stuff. It can affect loads of people in different ways. Mm. Uh, but those people aren't... There's nothing, like, objectively wrong with them. They're not ill. Mm. It's just that their brain works differently. Yeah, yeah. I think the only time autism... When I say problem, I don't mean to, to sort of... <laughs> That's even the problem. Me even trying to start trying mm-hmm. to say the sentence. If someone had problematic autism, really, it's just if they can't function as an individual. That's re- pretty much. That's the yeah. main time it becomes an actual proper issue. It's just like a lot of things. You get people. In which who, case, what you are you going to say then that people that have like severe forms of Down syndrome are like well, exactly that's problem? well that that's the thing exactly that's why I don't like using that yeah. that word and it's like you can use a, a paraplegic as a good example of um, someone with a obviously physical condition and it's mm-hmm. like well there are some paraplegics who can do everything by themselves perfectly fine and that's fine and there's others that need help and it's mm-hmm. it's okay and there's obviously people with quadriplegics who I think almost exclusively always need help and it's like different yeah. but it's like there's certain conditions which it is just sometimes you need help sometimes you don't it's that whole thing of people wanting to paint everything with like a one brush saying yeah. um, autism it's always bad it's terrible and no one can socialise if they're autistic it's like that's not yeah. even remotely close to even no. anything <laughs> Um, the one of the really really good things I saw from uh, someone trying to create a visual representation of the their autistic experience is they did a, they basically made a picture on word or paint or something mm-hmm. um, and just had loads of shapes and different colors to make it. here's an image and then they took the thin pencil mm-hmm. on the program and just scribbled all over it. So those shapes, now that you've put on the paper, in colour, all that sort of thing, are the important things that you see. And all the other stuff is like the background things that your brain doesn't pay much attention to because it's not the point of interest in what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then what they did is say, okay, this is normal person. Normal person, in air quotes. Mm. Um, then they basically, all they did, they didn't change anything out of the image apart from those, those were thin like grey lines they made them a bit thicker and a bit darker Mm -hmm. and suddenly the image is incredibly obscured yeah because all of this background information this background noise is really like there in the foreground Mm -hmm. and you like you get so much it's like I don't know what I'm looking at Mm -hmm. and that is that experience of that sensory overload it's like there's so much going on right now and their brain doesn't quite have the uh, method essentially to cut out what isn't needed and what is needed and what's important and then so it just everything and it's like no 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 overload yeah yeah 
that's a very good way of, of sort of putting it and and that sort of uh, analogy works in a lot of uh, mental conditions you know you mm-hmm. could do that you could use that exact analogy and say uh, the thin lines this is uh, very loosely but like uh, if you said like anxiety you know mm-hmm. if you social anxiety the thin gray lines are normal things which people worry about socially and when you mm-hmm. have more severe social anxiety those things are amplified so the mm-hmm. things that only seem like you know someone just says a quip about you about something you're potentially insecure about most people air quotes once again normal people um, brush it off but if you have social anxiety mm-hmm. they seem larger or more gravity to them or something and then it makes it harder to sort of focus on other things it it works in a lot of facets it's the thing with a lot of mental uh, conditions is that people like to really say black and white things about all of them and really like to cut them up and all it's like the way I, I've said on the podcast before, but it's like everyone in the world is fucked up. We're just all in different ways. And some are, you know, some are diagnosed with autism. Some are diagnosed with anxiety or depression or, you know, any of these things. And other people aren't diagnosed. It doesn't mean they haven't got anything. It doesn't mean there isn't another condition, you know, ADD, ADHD, you name it. You can, every personality type, an extreme version of that basically is a condition. But it's not even extreme, even a lot of the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the time, it's just a more inclined version, and it's it becomes that, which is mm. an issue. The important part to take away from that is that that those lines, the lines haven't changed. It's the same lines. You just changed where the emphasis is on the image mm-hmm. to represent the fact that the brain's not filtering that information out. Yeah. From the offset, mm-hmm. exactly. which is like where all the sensory overload comes from, because you're receiving the same amount of information, but it's not being filtered. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. It's basically sense. you're using a sieve through. You're looking through a sieve, and then you suddenly decide, okay, well, I'm going to use an ridiculously large mesh size, so I'm not actually like catching anything in the sieve. It's yeah. all just going straight through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, so why is it... So do you have any idea where... If you don't know, I may look it up. Do you have any idea where this whole anti-vaxxer thing came from? Like, it only um, seems to be the last few years, from my knowledge. No, it's been from the beginning. Has it? Yeah, and there was oh, somebody man. that did a study on vaccines causing autism. Uh, um, it was published and then peer-reviewed, and everyone was like, uh... No... <laughs> and then he actually was struck off and lost his license to practice medicine. Hmm. Um, uh, but unfortunately, something sensationalist like that spreads and proliferates and continues to spread long after it's come into light. I see. Uh, uh, the other thing, so that's the vaccines and autism thing. The other thing is the idea of heavy metals being used in vaccines, which at one point they were. Mm -hmm. I believe they're not anymore. Um, And people being concerned about, oh, you injected them with the vaccine, it's got mercury in it. And it's like, okay, the amount of mercury is like literally the most minuscule tiny amount of mercury. There's probably more mercury in the tinned tuna you had for lunch. Yeah. There we go. Well, that's it. People, people <laughs> just people will jump on the bandwagon to say, "Oh no, someone said something's bad. I'm not going to wear it." Um, without actually taking a step back and considering logically, essentially the evidence based stuff of it. Apparently, I'm. I'm, I'm just... You can't expect everybody to research everything, all that sort of thing. No. But as I've said before on this, I believe is that I just like to. I think it's, it's it's good to approach everything with a healthy level of scepticism. Mm-hmm. I think I've said before. You have, yeah. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Healthy scepticism. There we go. Well, that's it. That's, that's it. You Not know. scepticism. <laughs> no, scepticemia. So, yeah, that's healthy the- scepticemia. <laughs> it's like, obviously, with scepticism, it's one of those things that we said about this show before, which is like, you know, if anything in the show doesn't sound doesn't sound like it is uh, scientifically true. If I sound like I'm chatting bullshit. Look it up. Call me on it. And prove me wrong. Yeah, look it up. And if you find something, uh, you know, if, you, if one thing that people don't do a lot of the time as well, which, you know, I've not done in the past and I've had to make myself do a lot more recently, which is you say, oh, this is this. No, it isn't. It's that. Okay, I'm going to look it up. And then you go on Google, type it in, click on the first link, and then you're like, nope, that's it. It's all right. It's like, mm-hmm. You have to click on several links. Because I've had it before once or twice where I've thought something and I've Googled it. And obviously when you Google it, you can Google it in a certain way. Um, and it's more likely a certain outcome will come up. 
And then you click on the first one and then it's like, yeah, I'm proven right. And then it's like, I don't need to look at it anymore. So you should probably check two or three websites just to make sure, you know, if you go on like three major, say news websites, for example, tabloids or something, and they're talking about a specific study that's come out. If all three of them say generally the same thing, then you can probably assume that that's fairly accurate representation of it. Not in every circumstance, mm-hmm. obviously, but not going near political corruption or media representation corruption or anything like that, just generally. So you can kind of do that, but people like to, um, like to use outliers as their sort of, you know, they, they're one random thing. Yeah. It's a, a quite a big problem of, uh, misrepresentation of data, um, cherry picking data to fit your goal rather than looking at the data and saying, does this fit my goal or mm. my hypothesis or whichever, whatever you're calling it? It's like, just all we're asking is just be honest. <laughs> is it difficult? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was just looking it up, and apparently the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was looking it up, and um, there's been an anti-vaxxer movement since the 1800s, which is around the time that vaccinations were a thing. So yeah. you're right, literally, since the start, there's always been... It's like, uh, no, I'm not injecting dead disease into my body. That's going to kill me, is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Enjoy the smallpox. I wish I could just re- record like a zoom in of your face for this whole episode because that is it's just <laughs> hilarious. Um, which is one of those well, that's, that's actually yeah, that's that's where it all started is um, smallpox. And that's what I said online. Yeah, because yeah, the there was there's two things: there was smallpox, which was incredibly dangerous and deadly. Yeah, um, and cowpox, which was much less dangerous. Um, and they basically found I think it was was it Alexander Fleming. Well, let's find out. Or was he the one that made... Um, I think Fleming was um, penicillin. penicillin. Yeah. Um, it's basically saying... Oh, God, there's, there's a lot of information here. Because yeah. there's, there's even a French caricature from 1800 showing the fear the vaccination actually produced. Oh, that's oh, crazy. Yes. It looks like... A, I thought it was <laughs> fake. It was like, what? Um, um, yeah. But yeah, they found basically that the, the thing that... It was Edward... Uh, widespread smallpox vaccination, vaccination began in the early 1800s following Edward Jenner's cowpox there experiments. There we go, Jenner. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. So it was basically... He found that people with cowpox didn't contract smallpox. They were immune mm-hmm. somehow. Or you know, it may have been he noticed certain people just didn't contract smallpox. Yeah. Regardless of the contact. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, well, what has all these people got in common? They'd all had cowpox. Yeah, it turns out cowpox and smallpox were very similar, and having cowpox meant that your immune system was much better equipped to deal with smallpox. Yeah, and it's like was well, better to have cowpox in, in like really early days, layman's terms. Mm-hmm. It's like well, it's better for everyone. So if you could, a way to look think of it like that is almost like the cold and the flu. I know they're different things, but let's just argue cold and the flu are so similar that if you got the cold, you got a cold, you couldn't get the flu. It'd be like, mm-hmm. okay, let's just infect everyone with the cold because no one would die from a cold or next to no one. And then you'll be immune from the flu, which has a much higher mm-hmm. f- fatality rate. And then- the next to no one is a good point. And this whole idea actually links back to the MRSA because you know, sort of like MRSA being uh, the whole point is preventing it from spreading. Mm-hmm. Um, not everyone can have vaccines. Right. As you said, some people have underdeveloped or uh, weaker immune systems. Some people might actually be allergic to some of the ingredients in the vaccines. That's where a lot of the reactions come from, is people are allergic to the vaccine and then have a reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and what you do is, those people can't have vaccinations, full stop. Mm-hmm. So they're not immunized against the disease. But there's a critical point in the population at which if a certain number of people are vaccinated and are immune, it means that if the disease does pop up, it can't spread, Mm -hmm. which like say the the copper on the the door handles for MRSA, it's a principle called herd immunity Mm -hmm. because it's to do with like, you know, lots of people, one place, a herd of people. And if you have enough of that herd immune, the disease can't propagate through the herd because no one's everyone's immune to it. Yeah, yeah. apart from a couple of people. Yeah, exactly. Which is why it's such a massive issue, a massive importance to make sure that people that can be vaccinated aren't vaccinated. 
Uh, are vaccinated, sorry. Wow, that was a good yeah. one. That was like the whole um, point of the podcast, and they're like, they yeah. should never be vaccinated. Well, it's like, well I remember uh, I was reading one thing online, which was basically uh, an example is children at school. Um, I think certain places are now, because obviously in America, everything's more uh, over the top in a lot of ways. So there's far more anti vaxxers over there than there are proportionally in Britain. But mm. basically, there's certain schools now where I think they're starting to put in uh, legislation where they're saying, I'm if, pretty if you're sure not, that's a thing in Australia. It's Australia. I think they're talking about it because I'm mm. certain somewhere in Florida or California where there was like a preschool and someone got infected me. with stuff and they've gone, look, from now on, if you're not vaccinated, you're not coming in. Because what mm-hmm. from what I've read, and I would like you to correct me if I'm wrong, is like once – it's like an incubator in a sense. So say uh, that 100 children and then they've – you know, a lot of them have got vaccinations. If one of them gets ill – and then from the virus, and then the virus mutates within them. It can mutate to a level that the the vaccination all the other kids have would yeah. would not be able to fight him for. Yeah. And then if this if it gets incubated, for example, and becomes air quotes this is layman's terms, I want to clarify. If it become goes incubates in someone and becomes air quotes strong enough and more strong than say the vaccine was or something mm. like that, or mutates so it's different from the vaccine is, then it spreads. Then you basically got all these children to be vaccinated, and it's all nullified by one parent. You know, yeah, one. Um, yeah, that's just why it's so important because if you're saying, "Oh well, everyone else is vaccinated, so I'm not going to vaccinate my child," mm. but then if every other person does that, suddenly the herd immunity is completely compromised. Doesn't mm-hmm. work anymore. Yeah. Um, and I know you're using the word stronger. I know you said like air quotes, like yeah. whatever the layman's terms. Um, all it all it really needs to mutate to do is, you know, I said about the antigens and mm-hmm. the essentially the barcode on the cell. Because your immune system is recognizing that as foreign body, and then it already has the antibodies prepared for it to start going into mass production, essentially. Mm -hmm. All it needs to do is for those antigens on the outside of the cell to change, and then your immune system no longer recognizes them early on as something that it's encountered before and can rapidly deal with. Like a disguise, almost. Like a... So yeah. in a layman's terms, once again, like it's almost like a disguise. Like you change something slightly, they're like hmm. the virus is goes on, goes somewhere, gets a nose job, <laughs> wears a fake mustache, then infects the liver, yeah. and then suddenly they've realised what this strange mm. new person's doing in, in the liver. Yeah. Um, so yeah, boys and girls at home, vaccinations are super important. So yes. you know, make sure it's like get vaccinated. Unless you can't, if you can't, if you legitimately can't, don't because that's bad for you. Yeah, then you can rely on herd immunity. <laughs> Everyone else. But we rely on you for herd immunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and it, it's also one of those things where it's like, you know, being adults and vaccinated, that, that's, that is important. But children being vaccinated is the most important because yeah. obviously school... Think how much they come into contact with each other. Well, exactly. I was going to say, like, yeah. 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 You think... I remember in, in times in... When I was like primary school, I think it was year like one or mm. something, there'd be times where kids would just go around and because you're experiencing life and it's weird, just lick each other on the face. Yeah. Just like, and it's like, oh, that's oh, not- think how quickly headlines can spread around. Oh, God, yeah. Think yes. about even, even not even children, but things like, um, have you ever heard the term freshers flu? Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah where just- lots of people coming into one location from all different parts of the country. Yep. And because they're all from different parts of the country, the potential pathogens, pathogens is a word for a disease causing microorganism, mm-hmm. different pathogens that uh, how that are they're immune to essentially, mm-hmm. but they're carrying, so they don't get the symptoms for. But then they're just like coming into contact with all these people that because it's been coming from so far away, that's mutated essentially on its own, mm-hmm. and then they're all encountering it, and yeah. they're not immune to it because it's like from over here and mutated to be different and different enough. So now they all get really ill because they're not used to that pathogen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and freshers and flu. You get, I had it once. It was awful. I was in bed for like pretty much a week. Yeah, well, I know that um, Southampton especially is the wor- one of the yeah. worst places for freshers flu because we have two Irony, universities. I was the one that got freshers flu. Everyone else in the house were freshers reps and they were fine. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe that's it. It's the uh, it's the uh, exposure to it. Like, there's that idea that, um, for example, our friend Kieran, you know, he gets ill all the time and has a terrible yeah. immune system because one of the contributing reasons I think it is is because he works, um, you in know, like a hyper sterile environment. Yeah, he works in, in an environment where they have to wear, you know, like a full on like lab coats, gloves, all these other things. There's no bacteria, no germs because he works with lasers, so it's like you can't have dust in there and all that sort of jazz. Yeah. So 
you don't get those. That's, that's what, that's the thing with kids, you know, why you should allow kids to run about and get a bit messy and get a bit dirty and things like that. Because if you keep them inside all the time and keep them mm-hmm. air quotes safe from all the germs, they never build up an immunity to it. Yeah. And that, that's one of the issues. And with Freshers Flu, yeah, Southampton's, we you know, we got two universities and one of the most, uh, I think one of the bit largest areas of sort of nightlife in England, not the, but you know, one of them, uh, in the top 15 or whatever. And it's in South of England, especially, we've got such a huge nightlife and two universities. Mm-hmm. It's just like, and we're right near a dock as well. So at an airport. Yeah, so big, we've got a dock and airport. Tourist area. Mm. They've got two universities. Dogs, like, airport, it's, it's a, quite a heavily populated area as well. It's yeah. quite densely populated. I think our city and Plymouth, I think the only two cities in, in England, to my knowledge, um, that are cities due to their size. Because for a town to become a city, it has you just need... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, us and Plymouth are the only two cities that don't have a cathedral. But, mm-hmm. you know, the population of Southampton is 230,000 people. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> including out of Southampton, obviously. Um, but anyway, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Because we're coming up... We can wrap up nicely here, but if there's something else you'd like to add about um, I think that covers anything in that topic rather well. For, yeah, I think it was great. I, I, obviously, you're the smart one of this uh, in this podcast, so I've got a well. Uh, what's the word? Um, see, this is terrible. I'm trying to even wrap up, and my brain's just gone. Forget every word there is, except this one's you're speaking. Um, I was thinking, I think there's more that could be said, but I think it probably goes further than what we want for this particular thing. Yeah, yeah, we want to scratch the surface and everything. And if people get interested by, you know, as I say, you can always uh, contact um, us on, um, or contact Genuine Chit Chat on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, any of that, or my email, um, Genuine Chit Chat at Outlook. And then Michael will probably ask me. Michael will 100% ask you. It's not even a question. Like, if I get something I think I know the answer to, then I will just come straight to you with it. So I'll ask Josh and we'll look online and that sort of jazz. But I think that's about it, really. So, um, yeah, once again, Josh, thanks as always for coming on and sharing exactly. your knowledge. And um, I'm sure next time you'll be on to talk about gaming and stuff. So, uh, Yeah, some, something like that. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks again, Josh. And that's the end of the podcast. Thanks as always for tuning in, guys. Um, as I said before, um, there's numerous episodes of Science But Simple. I believe this is the sixth one. Uh, so be sure to just scroll back for all the episodes on your podcast feed, or you can go on um, YouTube, and I think I've grouped them together, um, and you can find out what all the other ones were about. Be sure to like us on the usual social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, Instagram, I generally post you know more pictures on, movie reviews, um, some podcasts have like corresponding photos to go along with them that I normally upload and things like that um, so Instagram is generally the best place to catch me and I just had a haircut so I'll be posting that on there soon because I know all of you who are listening to my show are really intrigued by my facial hair and well the hair on my head and my beard because I've got them both trimmed how about that then eh Coming up in the f- next few weeks, um, I've currently actually got six weeks worth of podcasts recorded. Um, I've got quite a few collaborations lined up. I think I've got three with other podcasters lined up. I, th- I may have a couple more. Um, a lot of them are going to be ones where like one, we do like one big conversation. Half gets released on this channel, half gets released on their show. Um, so it'd be nice to sort of see if we can cross pollinate some of our audiences. Um, but coming up next week, I've got a director who is from Australia who's legal legally blind um yes he is a director he's the first legally blind man to direct write edit and star in a feature length do- uh, film he's also created several short films has a production company and he's a really interesting guy and he's really funny as well actually so that's an absolutely great chat and that's uh, quite a long one so i'll be releasing that in two parts um after that um i've got a two-parter what's it after that i've got two other podcasts released i don't know what sort of order i'm going to release them in i'm just pretty certain the next week is going to be the uh blind di- director um his name is goff he's from beer nuts rather than speaking about him in like a, a third tent um I've got an episode recorded with Beth of We Fix Space Junk, which is another podcast. Um, they're an absolutely fantastic audio drama podcast. Um, and I spoke with Headley, who is um, Beth's partner, and they both created We Fix Space Junk. He's the sound engineer and producer, and she's the script writer, and they both have roles within it. So, you know, if you enjoy We Fix Space Junk, it's another great one to listen to. And um, I've got another episode recorded, another long one, like a two-parter, um, released with a gentleman called Bill, who is the magister of the Church of Satan. 
Um, now that obviously comes with a lot of weight to it. And I imagine a lot of you like myself would be thinking, uh, when you first heard of the church of Satan or Satanists or anything like that, you probably think of a pentagram with like a goat being sacrificed or something. And that could not be further from the truth. Um, they're like an atheistic, well, they're secular more really. Um, but they're kind of like a group of atheists who have a common philosophy and things. And that it's really interesting to hear about their philosophy and chat with him. And Bill's a really, really nice guy as well. So, you know, even if you don't go, and listen to the episode just know that satanism isn't or being a satanist isn't what the media would want you to think it is um at least with the church of satan i know there's like the satanic temple that's something completely different and loads of other things so yeah as I said, guys, apart from that, I've got loads of other collaborations and whatnot coming up, a few other guests. Uh, I think I mentioned this podcast at some point, me, Reese, and Josh going to get together and do a, a podcast about our favorite things to video games, because we did one about the gaming industry a few months back, complaining about uh, all the issues in the gaming industry and a lot to do with EA and microtransactions and things like that. So that's soon to be coming out as well. Well, I need to record that one, but I'm sure that'll come up eventually. That's about it from me, guys. So, you know, thanks as always for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you listening this far. And I'll talk to you all next week.